I was a Bernie bro. Once upon a time, I voted for him. It was the 2016 Missouri Democratic primary, and yep, I really did. I'm proud to say that I read, I learned, I traveled. In short, I grew out of it. But now I think back and I wonder why. Why and how did I go wrong? Well, a big part of it is that socialism tells some really powerful lies. The transformative change that will create shared prosperity, social equality, and true freedom for all. Sounds great, eh? Can you blame me for falling for it? Don't answer that. Because I mean, no matter how unrealistic the socialist utopia actually is with its complete reversal of everything we know about human nature, it continues to entice people, often with disastrous consequences. Let's explore those lies and whys. This is how we do for Mother Russia. Just look at Scandinavia. Those countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, have some of the highest standards of living in the world. And they're socialist, right? So shouldn't we follow their lead? So when we talk about democratic socialism, uh, Margaret, I'm talking about Finland, I'm talking about Denmark, I'm talking about Sweden, I'm talking about countries all over the world who have used their government to try to improve life for working families, not just the people on top. But that's lie number one. And to land the kill shot on that idea, here's Juan Carlos Hidalgo. I'm Juan Carlos Hidalgo. I'm president of the Social Christian Unity Party in Costa Rica. Scandinavia is not socialist. Juan Carlos is Cato's former policy analyst for Latin America, a region that's been battling the lies of socialism for a long, long time. Yeah, if you look at the Economic Freedom of the World Report that is published uh, yearly by the Fraser Institute, they divide economic freedom in five big categories. One of them is a size of government. That's where Scandinavian countries tend to rank poorly because they do have high taxes. They do have high levels of spending. However, if you look at the other four areas, Scandinavian countries tend to come up in the very top of the charts. Uh, we're looking at private property and rule of law. And Scandinavian countries tend to group in the top 10 of their ranking. Then you have monetary policy. You have sound currency. Uh, well, these, these countries uh, tend to have very good monetary policy. They, the inflation is low. Prices are stable, which is always very good for, for a market economy. Then you have openness to free trade. Well, these countries are among the, the most open around the world. And finally, labor regulations, uh, business regulations, uh, regulations on credit. Again, these countries tend to rank in the first quarter of, of nations uh, regarding the quality of the regulations they have. So overall, if you look at the economic freedom of the world report, you will see that uh, Scandinavian nations I think they rank between the, the first top 20, 20, top 25 nations in the world. Bernie Sanders keeps referring to them as example of democratic socialism. Bernie Sanders is selling a model that doesn't exist in Scandinavia. Here's where Latin America comes in. The countries in that part of the world have so thoroughly bought into this narrative about Scandinavian socialism, except with one fascinating difference. Even those high taxes in Scandinavia go after individuals, not businesses. Corporate tax rates there are actually fairly low, and businesses are the engine of wealth creation. But in, in, in Latin America, we have it backwards. We want to distribute wealth with taxing wealth creation, and we don't allow wealth to be created in the first place. Let's stay in Latin America for a second and visit Cuba for lie number two. Ever since 1962, when the US's trade embargo went into full effect, there's been this narrative that that's why Cuba's poor, because the US has limited or eliminated trade and travel there. That argument makes less than zero sense. It's downright hypocritical. If you're consistent in your socialism, you will believe that trading with, with the United States is a means of exploitation. I mean, this is the whole theory of dependency that was developed in the 1960s in Latin America. You know that through trade, Latin American countries were being exploited by wealthy countries. This lie about Cuba butts up against another one, which we covered in our video on the history of Marxism in Latin America, that society can be divided into oppressors and oppressed. Marxists call them 
bourgeois and proletariat, and that government's main duty is to eliminate the gap between them. According to that lie, the US and Europe have exploited Latin America through trade. I don't understand how, if you believe that free trade is bad and, 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 and trading particularly with the United States is bad, how then the sanctions explained Cuba's poverty. I'm against those sanctions. I think they are counterproductive, but Cuba is poor because it's socialist. Cuba is poor because it went after the private property of, of Cubans and the regime destroyed incentives for wealth creation. Cuba actually serves as a great counterpoint for this next lie, lie number three, that socialism is peaceful or that it can come about peacefully. Because as we know, socialism in Cuba was bloody and brutal. Fusilamiento, sí. Hemos fusilado. Fusilamos y seguimos, seguiremos fusilando mientras sea necesario. But more broadly, here's what I'm talking about, and let us know in the comments if this applies to you too. For me as a teenager, I looked at the hippies of the 1960s, you know, summer of love and all that, and I said that's how society can and should be. I was a big fan of the classic rock of that era too, so of course Woodstock was like some sort of communal collective nirvana where there were no laws, no force, no private ownership of anything, no worries just everyone coming together with a common goal. Three days of peace and music. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Also no bathrooms, food, personal space, and lots of mud. But they don't tell you how they're going to achieve that nirvana. Well, sooner or later, when you go after people's money, you need the force of the government behind you. And that's not, there's nothing peaceful about it, you know. Nope, there's nothing peaceful about governmental force, and there was nothing peaceful about any socialist movement in, well, recorded history. The Soviets under Stalin deliberately killed about six million non-combatants. And if you include foreseeable deaths from deportation, hunger, sentences, and concentration camps, it's closer to nine million. And that's without counting famines, wars, the Cambodian killing fields, Mao's cultural revolution, the Uyghur concentration camps, and so many more genocidal examples of socialism in action. And here's a related lie, lie number four, that socialism is based on cooperation, that it can emerge out of generosity, admiration of others, and goodwill. No, as we've seen, it always comes at the point of a gun, and forced cooperation is not really cooperation at all. Socialism, in fact, is the result of the definitional opposite of cooperation and goodwill. Socialism is based on envy, you know, and, and there's nothing, nothing good can come out of envy. Uh, and and uh, that's the problem when you institutionalize envy through economic policies. You know, like uh, I remember a, a question they asked then Senator Obama during the, the campaign in 2008, and they asked him, uh, would you favor raising the capital gains tax, uh, even though that will accrue less revenue for the government? Well, Charlie, what I've said is that I would look at raising the capital gains tax for purposes of fairness. That leads to, to the use of force against certain elements of, of society, certain uh, groups of society, and, and we have seen it over and over again in Latin America. The last, in the, we're not talking about centuries past, we're talking about the last decades. Leaving Latin America for now, because it's far from the only place where socialist policies have been tried, or should I say, inflicted upon people. But that's another broader lie, lie number five, that we hear from supporters of socialism. Sure, it was a bloody catastrophe in China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Korea, and Cuba, Venezuela, the Soviet Union, but real socialism has never really failed because it's never really been tried. Yeah, that's an old one, that's an old one. But once the disaster becomes clear, then you have that all say, you know, oh, this is not socialism, you know, when the socialism was, hasn't been tried. But that's the problem with socialism, I mean, because one of the key steps towards that nirvana that they aim at, uh, which is the, the abolition of private property and the state itself, requires empowering uh, a group of people uh, over the rest of society. In the end, you empower 
uh, dictators, you empower tyrants, and they end up destroying their societies. They also end up destroying the environment. Remember, as countries innovate and grow, they actually reduce their carbon footprints. That's because people who aren't in poverty can afford to care about the environment. For example, look at the Scandinavian countries socialists are so fond of claiming for their cause. Their GDPs are almost constantly rising. At the same time, their emissions and consumption of CO2 are almost constantly falling. When people become more prosperous, they start demanding uh, environmental quality. They start demanding environmental standards around them. And that's why there is what people call the goodness environmental curve, which is that as societies start growing by being poor, they start destroying nature, they start destroying the environment. But once they reach a threshold of income, and the, the average is uh, between 10,000 10, and 11,000 uh, dollars per capita, that's when people start demanding uh, environmental goods, environmental quality, environmental policies. And that's when we do see that environmental degradation starts falling. And the richer societies become after that, the greener, the healthier they become. And that's what we see in, in Europe. You know, now you can swim in the River Thames in, in London, whereas it was a su open switch uh, 100 years ago. But by killing profit signals and incentives, socialism stifles innovation and growth. It ensures that people in poverty stay in poverty. It guarantees that folks will have to care about securing basic necessities instead of things higher up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like the environment. And yet that's another lie. Number six, if you're keeping score at home, we hear all the time that socialism is better for the environment or that a socialist policy will be, such as Green New Deal. Green New Deal legislation. The Green New Deal. But the very nature of socialism tells another story. One of the things that characterizes socialism is that there is no accountability and, and governments can do whatever they want without following rules. And one of the rules that uh, they all usually uh, trample on are environmental rules. If you look at the disappearance of the Aral Sea in, in Kazakhstan, uh, it was mostly due to uh, central planning uh, uh, policies back up from the days of the Soviet Union. Uh, and we see that uh, around the world, particularly in those countries that have had central planning systems. Which brings us to the lie that contains all the others. Let's call this lie number seven, that societies can be centrally planned. You understand the appeal, right? Think about what causes anxiety and stress in your own life. For example, when you feel that you don't have control of something, like the actions of a family member, a disease. Take that idea up a notch and you can see how society, the actions of 8 billion other people, might cause us all stress. Wouldn't it be so, so comforting to know that someone, even if it's not you, were in control? To know that someone somewhere, like the pricing czar in the Soviet Union, had a plan? But any central plan is bound to fail. No one person or group of people can anticipate or know everything about everyone. Picture yourself atop a tall building at dusk. Look around, envision all the people and all the buildings below you. Envision the couple making dinner here, the guy reading a book there, the single mom doing her taxes in this apartment, the retired man in the elevator returning from a walk with his dog, all with different interests, skills, desires. Go ahead. Try to develop a plan for the rest of their evenings that makes them all happy. However, a decentralized network that leverages the interests, skills, and desires of its 8 billion participants, the cognitive capacity of such a network would come as close as possible. There's a term for such a thing, the free market. With the rise of the Bernie Sanders wing, Bernie bros and all like I used to be, we hear a lot about democratic socialism. Welcome to lie number eight. You're from Russia. I don't know if you've ever visited Finland. Is Finland, uh, Finland is a neighbor to Russia. They have a very democratic society with strong democratic socialist principles. We've already debunked the idea that the Scandinavian countries really are socialist. But just in case, here's the prime minister of Denmark. I know that uh, some people in, in the US associate the Nordic model with some sort of socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. 
Uh, Denmark is uh, far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. I mean, I get it from Bernie's perspective. If I wanted to get elected president as a socialist, I too would try to distinguish myself from people like Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot. For my part, this notion of democratic socialism is a distinction without a difference. As a former Bernie supporter, I heard the word socialist. I was drawn to some green, communal, hippie, Scandinavian fantasy land, and boom, they had my vote. But adding that word democratic is particularly ironic. When you're democratically choosing between two or three or four would-be central planners, there's nothing democratic about it. Only free markets are truly democratic. In free markets, people don't just cast votes. They put their money where their mouths are, by buying and selling. Socialism, in all its forms, and by definition, smothers free markets.